Good afternoon. We start this afternoon with First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Presiding officer, this is my first opportunity in the Chamber since the cowardly attack in London last Saturday night to record my horror at what happened and my deepest sympathies to all those affected. My thoughts, I'm sure the thoughts of the whole Chamber, are with those who lost their uh, loved ones on Saturday night and all those who sustained injuries. Uh, later today, I'll have engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Thank you. Ruth Davidson. I'd like to associate myself and my party with the words of the First Minister. Our thoughts and prayers go to the victims in London and their families. Um, Presenting officer, to ask the First Minister why she believes that private conversations shouldn't stay private. First Minister. Well, actually, I do uh, believe that. But, of course, the conversation that Ruth Davidson is alluding to uh, was taken from the private sphere into the public sphere, not by me, but by Kezia Dugdale. Uh, the fact of this conversation and a very selective account of the content of that was fir first put into the public domain uh, on the 23rd of February in the Times newspaper, uh, where it said Ms Dugdale revealed that she held secret talks with the First Minister. Uh, that is uh, what gave me uh, the ability to talk about that. Uh, the part, of course, in that conversation that Kezia Dugdale didn't refer to was the part I spoke about last night and stand by 100%. But let me get to the nub of the matter here, because the nub of the matter is all of the opposition parties in this chamber uh, have tried to use the issue of an independence referendum in this election as a smokescreen. As a smokescreen. In the Tories' case, it's because they don't want to talk about their toxic policies. Toxic policies like the rape clause that made Ruth Davidson squirm so much last night. Toxic policies like austerity cuts and extreme Brexit and, of course, removing the rights of pensioners. So the key question tomorrow is how we stop the Tories getting a stronger hand to do more damage to Scotland. Let's make sure we don't boost Theresa May's majority. Let's make sure we send strong SNP MPs to stand up for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. Well, she's rolling back today, but everybody now knows don't have a private chat with this First Minister because if it suits her purposes, everybody will get to hear about it. <laughs> but we are still left, we are still left with a big question. The First Minister says that Kezia Dugdale told her she'd drop Labour's opposition to an independence referendum. And Kezia Dugdale says it's all a pack of lies. Both of them can't be right, so which one is it? Well, uh, just, can I... First Minister, just be careful about use of parliamentary language in this discussion. First Minister. Well, can I just say uh, that people should think twice, of course, about having any conversation with Ruth Davidson, because if her Twitter account is anything to go by, she records it um, <laughs> for later Absolutely. use. Although I noticed, I noticed that tweet was hastily deleted <laughs> overnight. Um, look, I, I stand by... 100% at what I said last night. And in fact, if anybody reads what Labour and Kezia Dugdale were saying in public around that time, they will see uh, the ring of truth yeah. about it. Labour themselves were saying that all options, including an independence referendum, were under consideration. Yeah. That yeah. is the reality. It's on uh, the record. There's an article on Labour's website even today confirming that but of course of course this comes back to the heart of the matter all of the other parties in this chamber want to avoid the real issue in this election tomorrow and the real issue is this the only way in Scotland to stop the Tories tightening their grip and getting a bigger majority to do what they want in Scotland is to vote SNP Labour's not strong enough to take on the Tories anymore. It's not that long ago that Kezia Dugdale seemed to be advising people in parts of Scotland to vote Tory in the election. If you want to take on the Tories tomorrow, if you want to make sure Scotland has strong voices 
in the House of Commons, standing against austerity, standing up for Scotland, then vote SNP tomorrow. Ruth Davison. Presiding officer, the truth is we don't need the First Minister to tell us what we already know, which is that the Labour Party can't be trusted to stand up to the SNP. And it's not just Kezia Dugdale, because Jeremy Corbyn is even worse. She says you can have your Indy ref, and he says absolutely fine. The First Minister has dragged Kezia Dugdale onto her ground. And given what she's seen of Mr Corbyn, how would she rate her chances of success with him? First Minister. Well, my focus today and tomorrow is to persuade as many people across Scotland as I possibly can of this. The only way to stop Theresa May, who is on the ropes in this election, getting a bigger majority is to make sure we don't send Tory MPs to boost that majority and strengthen her hand. Let's make sure tomorrow we send SNP MPs to the House of Commons to stand up for Scotland and make our voice heard. Ruth Davidson. President officer, the last 24 hours have set out the choice that people face at the polls. With the SNP, it's straight back to another divisive referendum on independence. With Labour, it's, I'm not sure, I'll phone a friend and I'll see what she thinks. And with us, it's clear. No to a second referendum, no to more uncertainty, no to the division it would cause our country. I've listened to the people of Scotland and they don't want her referendum. So for pity's sake, First Minister, let it go. First Minister. Actually, something at last that I can agree with Ruth Davidson about. The last 24 hours, indeed the, the duration of this campaign, have set out very clearly the choice for the people of Scotland. If people in Scotland vote for Tory MPs tomorrow, what they are voting for are MPs that will go to the House of Commons and vote for policies like the rate clause, yep. vote for more benefit cuts, vote for more austerity cuts, MPs that will vote for the dementia tax, yep. vote to take away the winter fuel yep. allowance, vote to take away the pension triple lock. That's what people will get if we send Tory MPs to Westminster. On the other hand, if we send strong SNP voices to Westminster, we get MPs who will stand against austerity, MPs who will stand up for pensioners, MPs who will stand against more cuts that punish the poorest in our society. The only way to stop the Tories in Scotland is to vote SNP tomorrow. Question two, Kezia Dugdale. Can I offer the thoughts of these benches to the families affected by the atrocious attacks in London and ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the week? First engagement Minister. to take forward the government's programme for Scotland. <clears throat> Kezia Dugdale. President Oster, if the last 24 hours show us anything, it's that this First Minister will say anything to deflect from the SNP's appalling record in office. But people across the country want the First Minister to focus on the day job. Yeah, yeah. So can she tell us why the number of unfilled posts for nurses and midwives are at an all-time high? First Minister. Firstly, can I say to Kezia Dugdale that I know what was said in that conversation and so does she and I'm standing here in the chamber of the Scottish Parliament and I am certain of what was said and you know what there is nothing wrong whatsoever with Kezia Dugdale having changed her mind since then but what is wrong is for Kezia Dugdale having held that view to suggest that people who still hold that view are somehow expressing something unthinkable. That, I think, is what is not legitimate. Now, on the issue... On... Order. On the issue of staff in our National Health Service, there are... There are today 12,000 more people working in our National Health Service than when this government took office. We have more nurses, more doctors, uh, more allied health professionals in our health service than ever before. We've got more per head of population uh, than any other part of the UK. And that's because this government is investing in our health service and doing so to a much greater extent than Labour would be if they were in office. So there are enough nurses in the health service. That's the latest fib from the First Minister. Uh, Mr. Dugdale, was... Ms. Dugdale, you can't use parliamentary language like that, please. Another question. Okay, uh, President Officer, that's other stuff that she's not told the truth about. 
It was this first no, minister. No, no, Mr. Dale, Mr. Dale. The, the point here is to be respectful and courteous to other members, and not and not to impugn their character in that way. I, I recognise there is a disagreement about accuracy. However, do not impugn somebody else's character in the chamber. Mr. Dugdale. President Officer, it was, of course, this First Minister who took the decision to slash paces for student nurses and midwives when she was the Health Secretary. And that is why we have a shortage of nurses and midwives in the NHS in Scotland. And, of course, that has severe consequences for the care that patients receive. Yeah. We know from the figures released this week that almost 500 operations were cancelled because of pressures on NHS resources. Yeah. That's hundreds of people who didn't get the treatment they needed because the SNP's priorities are all wrong. So does the First Minister regret not spending enough time on the day job? Yep. First Minister. Let me. In January of this year, we announced a 4.7% increase in intakes to pre-registration nursing and midwifery programmes. That's an extra 151 places. The fifth successive rise, which equates to 3,360 entry places. And under this government, there's been an average of 1,000 more nurses in training each year compared to the previous administration. That is the record of this government when it comes to nurse training. In terms of uh, cancelled operations, uh, there is always... Uh, a small number of operations cancelled. Uh, that can be for a variety of different reasons. But the overwhelming vast majority of operations in our health service go ahead as scheduled. And that is down to the fantastic work done by doctors and nurses and everybody else working across our health service. <laughs> yet more fake news from the First Minister. Now, here's the reality. Missed A&E targets, operations cancelled because of pressure on NHS staff and resources, and thousands of patients trapped in hospitals when they are fit to go home. That should shame the First Minister, except we know that nothing really does. Tomorrow we can kick the Tories out of office and get a Labour government. A Labour government that will work night and day to invest in our schools and our hospitals, delivering a real living wage of £10 an hour. A Labour government that will deliver £3 billion more for public services. Isn't it the case that the only way to get a Labour government tomorrow is to vote Labour? First Minister. Here we have another flip-flop from Kezia Dugdale. It's not that long ago she was telling all of us that Jeremy Corbyn was completely unelectable. Now she's blowing with the wind all over again. Do you know, the problem for Kezia Dugdale and Labour is this. They have spent all of their time in this campaign attacking the SNP and letting the Tories completely off the hook. Kezia Dugdale even did suggest a couple of weeks ago that there were parts of Scotland where people should actually vote Tory. That is what she said. The reality is a vote for Labour tomorrow, a vote for the party that was beaten into third place last year, risks letting a Tory MP in the back door. The only party in Scotland that's got the strength to take on the Tories is the SNP. If you want rid of the Tories, in Scotland. If you want MPs elected that actually agree with Jeremy Corbyn on more issues than Kezia Dugdale does, then vote for the SNP tomorrow. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you to ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Tuesday. Patrick Harvey. Uh, Presiding officer, may I first uh, share the reflections of other members on the tragic events in London, the, the shock and dismay that we felt and our condolences to those affected. Uh, I'm sure the First Minister will also want to join me uh, in condemning the US President for his opportunistic attack on the London Mayor at a time when Londoners were still coming to terms with what had happened. <laughs> However, the democratic process doesn't stop and in these closing stages of an election campaign, there is more at stake than who said what to whom a year ago. There are critically important choices facing our society and our economy. Greens have long argued for investment in the new sustainable industries which will provide jobs for the long term, jobs in the post 
oil economy instead of throwing ever greater tax cuts and subsidies at the fossil fuel industry. Yet the First Minister continues to say that her primary aim is to maximise extraction of fossil fuels. And even one of the newspapers endorsing the SNP states today, our industrial base has been exposed as too heavily reliant on oil. So far, nothing has been done to replace that. How can the First Minister defend continued subsidies and tax breaks to the biggest polluters on the planet? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I uh, say that I share Patrick Harvey's uh, view of the comments of President Trump about the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. I think we should all deprecate uh, those comments at a time when the Mayor's city had just uh, been the victim of a horrific terrorist attack. I think the least he should have been able to expect uh, was complete support and loyalty from a country uh, that is a long-standing ally uh, of this country. Um, on Patrick Harvey's substantive question, I don't think these two things are either or. I do think the importance of the oil and gas sector to our economy and currently to the provision of our energy needs is such that we do have an obligation to support it. I spoke yesterday morning at the Oil and Gas UK conference in Aberdeen and spoke about the importance of that sector and the work this government is doing uh, to make sure uh, that we help it recover uh, and have that bright future that I certainly think that it does. Uh, but we also uh, were speaking about the ability of the skills that have been developed in oil and gas to be transferred uh, into uh, other areas of our energy sector, renewable energy uh, in particular, and there's a great opportunity there. Uh, but we also, and this government has got a very good record when it comes to renewable energy and when it comes to meeting climate change uh, targets. We have some of the most ambitious targets in the world, met them uh, years ahead of schedule. We're already uh, generating more than 50% of our uh, energy, uh, electricity uh, use from renewable energy. So we continue to invest in renewable energy to make sure that we are making that transition uh, to a low or no carbon economy. Uh, and that, as Patrick Harvey is aware, is a key priority of this government. Patrick Harvey. There is certainly an urgent need to support people to transition into new industries as well as to maximise the opportunities from decommissioning. But there is absolutely, absolutely a contradiction between maximising extraction uh, and those climate change commitments that the First Minister speaks of. Uh, the First Minister has already condemned Donald Trump's uh, decision to withdraw the US from the Paris Agreement. But if that agreement is ever to be more than just a piece of paper. It's vital that it requires greater action from all countries. It's undeniable that the world has far more coal, oil and gas than we can afford to burn. And the First Minister's former climate change minister agreed, accepting that at least a proportion of what is still in the North Sea must be left there. Isn't it clear, though, that only green voices are challenging the policy that unites the SNP with all three political parties which have played a role in the UK government, that policy of maximum oil and gas extraction? Is it, is it undeniable that that commitment, that policy, is incompatible with any meaningful commitment to the Paris Agreement? How much of the North Sea's fossil fuels does the First Minister believe must be left unburned if we're to make a fair contribution to that Paris goal of limiting climate change to 1.5 degrees? First Minister. Well, I think on some of this, uh, not on all of it, but in some of this, Patrick Harvey and I might just have to agree to disagree. I don't believe uh, that there is that incompatibility. I do think the importance of the oil and gas sector to our economy and to the development of the skills that are important in terms of developing renewable energy are such that we should continue to support uh, that sector. There are many, many jobs, of course, dependent on activity in the North Sea. Uh, and of course, as a result of advances in technology, uh, many of which are being developed here in Scotland, uh, there are new and innovative ways of using hydrocarbons uh, that are emerging, uh, offering uh, that continued opportunity. So we're seeing new uh, technologies like hydrogen, uh, source, energy sources like hydrogen, new technologies like uh, carbon capture and storage. So I think it's right that Scotland continues to seek to be a world leader in all of these uh, different areas of our energy sector. And I come back to the uh, central point here in terms of the Paris uh, Climate uh, Agreement, and I bitterly regret the decision of President Trump to take America uh, out of that agreement. Uh, we are 
meeting our climate change targets. Uh, we are meeting the targets we've set in terms of renewable energy. And of course, we're going further and setting even more ambitious targets. So we're also leading the world when it comes to discharging our obligations to the planet as well. Question number four, Willie Rennie. Uh, to ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. Uh, can I share the sentiments expressed by others about the London attacks? My thoughts are with families and friends of the, the victims of those attacks. Um, yesterday, the NHS report on mental health services for young people was appalling. I thought I'd got the First Minister on board for taking strong action to sort that. I have asked her time and again about this. I've heard warm words before as well. But the latest figures show that more young people are waiting for treatment and they are waiting for longer too. Why are things worse this year than last year? First Minister. Well, I don't uh, think that's the case. And I, I know we've got an election tomorrow. Um, but I still hope that after this election, we can have some consensus around the issue of mental health. If we take the stats that were published yesterday around uh, child and adolescent mental health uh, services, uh, we uh, saw some improvement in terms of uh, waiting times. Uh, uh, we, we also saw that 10 of the 14 health boards across Scotland are meeting the 18-week uh, standard, which is uh, up from only seven in the last uh, quarter. Uh, yes, there were a number of young people waiting over a year uh, for treatment, uh, which is unacceptable. Uh, that was 74 people, 1.7%. Uh, but again, that is down uh, from 2.4% in the final quarter of 2016. Uh, so we have, like many other countries do, uh, got challenges challenges to address in terms of meeting the increased demand for mental health. But because of the investment that we're making and because of the mental health strategy that we are pursuing, we are seeing progress and we are determined to continue to make that progress. Willie really Rennie. I can tell the First Minister that there will never be a consensus in this Parliament as long as this government continues to fail on mental health. The facts, year on year, fewer people, fewer young people treated this year than last year. Those people had to wait longer. Waiting times are up. Health boards are missing their targets. In fact, it's worse. The targets have never, ever been met. For adults, the performance for psychological therapies is worse this year than it ever has been before. This is why ordinary people are now prepared to stand up, and we've seen it throughout the election campaign, prepared to stand up and tell the First Minister when she is getting it wrong and our government is failing. I've been asking about mental health pretty much every week for three years. The First Minister will say she has this brand new strategy, but what she won't tell you is that it was delayed for 15 months. So will she guarantee that things will be better than this next year. Can she guarantee that? First Minister. Uh, we are seeing improvements and we intend to continue to see improvements. We're seeing more investment, uh, more people working. The overall CAMS workforce has increased uh, by 65% over the last uh, number of years. We've seen nursing posts increase. Uh, we've seen significant increased investment in mental health generally, and particularly in child and adolescent mental health services. In terms of the uh, CAM stats that Willie Rennie uh, asked me about uh, earlier, 83.6% uh, uh, were seen in 18 weeks. That is an increase in the previous uh, quarter. Uh, 3,621 seen within 18 weeks, uh, 712 waiting longer than 18 weeks. So we are seeing improvements in these areas, uh, but I recognise we have more to do, which is why we are investing more uh, and why we are following the mental health strategy. And we will continue to do so, so that we can continue to see uh, more progress over the next months and over the next year. A couple of supplementaries. The first from uh, Ash Denham. To ask the First Minister how her government has protected Scotland's budget in the face of Tory cuts. That's a good question. Well, well, it's interesting that, that, of course, the other parties uh, don't want to hear about this because we hear, we hear a lot, rightly, from other parties about public services. But what people like Willie Rennie don't tell us is, well, why has party 
was in government with the Tories for five years. Uh, the budget of this parliament was cut by £2 billion. That's what Willie Rennie uh, and his colleagues did to the budget of this parliament. But we have continued to protect what matters in Scotland. That's why we have increased the health budget by £3 billion and we will increase it even further over the life of this parliament. So we will continue to do whatever we can to protect the budget of this parliament and protect our vital public services. Monica Lennon. Thank you. First Minister, you will recall that on the 19th of May, strike action by further education lecturers in the college sector was suspended to allow negotiations to continue. This came after Colleges Scotland agreed to implement phase one of the March 2016 agreement. However, lecturers did not receive the agreed pay rise in their end of May wage, and it may be the end of August before it reaches their bank accounts. They are angry and they feel betrayed, and threats of further strike action are emerging. This is not what was agreed just a matter of weeks ago when John Swinney intervened personally and asked EIS, EIS Fila to call off the strike. Does the First Minister agree that further education lecturers suspended the strike in good faith and should be paid exactly what was agreed without further delay? And when I raised this with the First Minister back in April, she rightly said that employers should go the extra mile. Would the First Minister say whether she believes they have gone the distance and why the talks are failing despite the Scottish Government's appointment of John Sturrock QC as facilitator? First Minister. Well, firstly, I was very pleased that an agreement was struck that allowed uh, strike action to be called off because that strike action was in nobody's interest, not in the interest of students and not in the interest of college lecturers who work so hard to deliver education for our students. Uh, that agreement was not easy to reach and of course uh, the government did uh, intervene in the way that Monica Lennon has outlined. Uh, that agreement then was reached and I do expect now that agreement uh, to be implemented so that we can make sure there is no further risk of strikes that would be damaging to students in our colleges. Gillian Martin. To ask the First Minister what progress our government is making in getting more young people into modern apprenticeships. First Minister. Uh, we uh, saw statistics just uh, this week uh, showing that we have exceeded our modern apprenticeship target of 26,000 for 2016 17. Uh, employers, I think, are recognising the value of the opportunities they bring to increase skills in our workforce and encourage uh, new talent. The latest modern apprenticeship figures show that we're on track to meet our target of 30,000 by 2020, uh, and we're committed to enhancing the apprenticeship programme to respond to the needs of employers. Uh, Alec Rowley. Presiding officer, I agree with the First Minister when she say, talks about the impact of failed Tory austerity on communities up and down Scotland, the devastating impact. But the question people are asking is, when is this government going to start to defend those communities? This year we see £170 million in cuts to local public services. Our public services are bursting at the seams. They can't continue. Will she defend public services moving forward? First Minister. Well, Alec Rowley is just wrong, and we've had this debate in the Chamber so many times. There is an additional £400 million of investment for local services this year compared to last year. That includes things like extra money for social care and, of course, the £120 million that's going direct to head teachers to help us close the attainment gap. In addition to that, of course, it is this government that's spending more than £100 million every year mitigating the impact of Tory welfare cuts like the bedroom tax. So this government is continuing to do everything we can to support local services, but also to mitigate the impact of damaging Tory cuts. And on the question of Tory cuts, it is the damage that Tory cuts are doing to communities across this country that makes it all the more astounding that so many Labour councillors, the length and breadth of this country, seem so keen to do deals with the Tories to get them into administration in different councils. Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you. Can I ask the uh, First Minister what the estimate is for the number of additional children who will be living in poverty by 2021 as a result of Tory tax and welfare policies? First Minister. I, I don't think child poverty is funny. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the Tories, the Tories are laughing. 
at a question about child poverty. Let me give the answer to this. And this answer comes not from me or my officials, it comes from the Institute of Fiscal Studies. As a result of Tory tax and benefit changes by 2021, they estimate that an additional, an additional one million children across the UK will be living in poverty. That will take the total number of children living in poverty to more than five million, equivalent to the entire population of Scotland. That is why we need strong voices in the House of Commons standing against Tory cuts and standing against the Tory assault on the poorest in our society. And Neil Findlay. Line officer, with the number of planted questions, I think we're at Gardner's question time today. <laughs> uh, this week, this week a number, this week a number of Middle East, this week a number of Middle East countries cut links to Qatar because of its support for terrorism. For years, the Scottish government has sought to develop business links to that country, sending the current transport secretary on a trip with Tory MP Sir Nicholas Soames to try and develop business links, asking them to invest in their sovereign wealth fund in Scottish schools, roads and infrastructure projects. In light of these recent developments, has the Scottish Government uh, revised its policy towards the Qatari regime? First Minister. Well, just in point of fact, the Scottish Government does not currently have in place any contracts with suppliers based in Qatar. Uh, we, of course, the Scottish Government will always make the case for jobs and investment in Scotland, but we expect all countries to comply with international human rights law and we will always use our international engagement as an opportunity to promote respect for and understanding of human rights. And that will be the case with Qatar, as it will be with other countries across the world. Question number five, Claire Hockey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will reaffirm its commitment to the Paris Climate Accord. First Minister. Uh, yes, the Scottish Government remains fully committed to the Paris Agreement. The need for international cooperation is greater than ever, uh, and the decision by President Trump to withdraw the US from the Paris Agreement is short-sighted, uh, deeply irresponsible, and I think downright wrong. Uh, the low-carbon transition uh, presents, of course, challenges to all countries, but it also gives important opportunities for both our economy and our society. And I think it is vital for all countries to stay the course. Uh, the Scottish Government will demonstrate our commitment by bringing forward proposals for an ambitious new climate change bill in response to the goals of the Paris Agreement over the coming weeks. Claire Hockey. Thank the First Minister for her answer. Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor and French President Emmanuel Macron have both expressed condemnation of the US withdrawal from the accord. Does the First Minister share my view that the UK government should have been far more robust in its response and that Theresa May should have shown leadership in this rather than lacking the backbone to stand up to President Trump? Yeah. Um, First Minister. I, I, like I'm sure many people right across this chamber, to be fair, would very much have liked to have seen uh, the Prime Minister on behalf of the UK sign the letter uh, that France, Germany and Italy uh, sent uh, to, to President Trump. Uh, sometimes it does feel as if the Prime Minister is more concerned with not offending President Trump than she is about doing the right thing uh, for this country, and I think that is the wrong approach. Uh, the Paris Agreement was secured through very long and very difficult negotiations in 2015. It followed uh, more than 20 years of international consensus building, so the focus of all countries should now be on implementation. Uh, that's certainly uh, the focus that this government will have as we make our contribution to making sure that the aims of the Paris Agreement are taken forward and fulfilled. Maurice Golden. Presiding officer, as a society, we need to burn and landfill less resources. However, the current draft climate change plan does not consider energy from waste. Perhaps this is because, according to their own figures, the Scottish government are planning a 12 fold increase in incineration over the next five years. Layered on top of this, councils might be contracted to burn and recycle the same waste. Clearly, that cannot happen. So in the interests of the Paris Climate Accord, will the First Minister agree with the Scottish Conservatives on a moratorium on new incinerator construction? 
First Minister. Well, of course, the, the draft climate change plan is just that. It's a draft. It's there for consultation and for contributions to be made. If the Scottish Conservatives want to put forward that proposal, of course, that is something that will be given due and proper consideration by the government. Uh, both our climate change plan and our uh, draft energy strategy show real ambition in this area. Uh, and they are both there for consultation so that we can move forward to a position where we've got maximum consensus as we uh, move our country forward, uh, doing some very difficult things to meet uh, more ambitious climate change targets, but doing uh, the things that are right, not just for Scotland, but for the whole of the world. Ross Greer. Thank you. States, mayors, industry and the American public are all rejecting Donald Trump's bizarre attempt to make the US a rogue state on climate change. And he'll fail because fossil fuels have already had their day. For one American job, for every one American job in coal, there are three in renewables. He's literally tilting at windmills. But the First Minister's US engagement strategy commits the Scottish Government to engaging with states and US agencies on tackling climate change. What has been done to deliver this commitment and what further progress will be made in light of Donald Trump's recent announcement? First Minister. Well, a few weeks ago, I uh, met with the Governor of California and signed an agreement uh, to commit Scotland and the State of California to work together uh, on issues around climate change. And we will continue to explore opportunities to do likewise with other American states. I mean, I, as I've said, disagree very strongly with uh, the decision that President Trump took on the Paris Agreement. Uh, but one thing that I think is important to stress is, you know, because of the, the way the United States is governed, much of the responsibility for taking forward uh, initiatives that are about tackling climate change lie in the responsibility of the states. So I think the uh, states and cities indeed in America have a big role to play. And I think Scotland, uh, the UK as a whole, if it chooses to, and other countries can uh, have a contribution here by trying to work with those states and cities uh, to take this forward. Scotland is very active uh, in working, not just in the United States, but across the world uh, with regions and cities uh, to make sure that we're making our full contribution and we will continue to do that. And James Kelly. How does the First Minister support for the Paris Agreement uh, match with the introduction of the new air departure tax bill, which will result in reduction in charges by 50%, which will increase carbon emissions and also result in reductions to the Scottish budget of up to £189 million? Pounds? First Minister. Uh, James, uh, James Kelly is aware, the Committee on Climate Change actually uh, looked specifically at, at this and uh, said, which is something the government absolutely accepts, that if we do anything, whether on this policy area or anything else, that has an adverse effect on emissions, then we have a corresponding uh, responsibility to make sure uh, we compensate for that in other ways. So that is factored in uh, to our thinking and our planning around climate change. And we'll continue to take the decisions that balance growing our economy, which I think all of us accept is vitally important, supporting business uh, to generate uh, the economic activity and the wealth that we need to support our public services with making sure we're doing absolutely the right things by our environment and tackling climate change and will continue to operate in exactly that way. Question number six, Donald Cameron. <laughs> to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that more than one in four GP practices have a vacancy. First Minister. Uh, we've increased GP recruitment and retention funding this year from £1 million to £5 million as part of our £71 million investment package and direct support of general practice. In addition, we've increased GP training places and this year we've doubled the number of £20,000 bursaries for hard-to-fill training posts. Uh, GP recruitment is challenging, but it is welcome that the recent BME GP vacancy survey showed the vacancy rate had reduced by two percentage points in the last year. Donald Cameron. The BMA have also commented that every unfilled vacancy puts more and more strain on remaining GPs who must struggle to cover the gaps in their practice while also coping with increased demands on their services. Does the First Minister agree with that assessment? And given staffing today is affected by recruitment and training decisions taken several years ago, does she take personal responsibility for a crisis in workforce planning across the NHS? First Minister. Well, I do agree with uh, the assessment uh, generally uh, that the member uh, read out there. Uh, and I also take responsibility for making sure this government is taking the action to help address the challenge uh, that we and other countries have around GP recruitment. Uh, investment in GP services has gone up each and every year under this government. Uh, funding and direct support of general practice will increase by £250 million by the end of this parliament. That's part of our wider commitment to increase primary care funding uh, by £500 
million. Pounds. The uh, BMA SGPC chair, uh, Dr Alan McDevitt, said that this was a positive step in the right direction towards a shared vision of general practice. Uh, can I say that we absolutely take our responsibility to address these challenges, uh, but possibly the worst thing that we could see right now in terms of addressing recruitment challenges, whether they're for GPs or nurses or any other part of our public service, is to have the ability of the best and brightest from across Europe to come to this country. That's the real and present danger to all of our efforts to tackle this that the Tories present uh, to Scotland and to the UK as a whole right now. And Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what action her government is taking to recruit more staff into our NHS and whether she will update Parliament on the latest NHS staffing figures. First Minister. Well, as I've said, we have more staff working in our NHS than ever before. Staffing in the NHS is at record levels. We have challenges with vacancies uh, for some groups of staff, which we are working uh, to address. Uh, but there are more staff in our NHS, and you know, it is because of the efforts uh, of those staff that patients across the country get the excellent care and treatment uh, that they do. And I think all of us should be very grateful to them for that. Thank you. And that concludes First Minister's questions. Uh, point of order, Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister just a few moments ago claimed uh, that the increased aviation emissions that will arise from the aviation tax policy have been factored into the draft climate change plan. In my reading of that plan, there is no such assessment of the increased emissions that will come as a result of that policy or any specific commitments to policies that will mitigate those emissions and reduce them elsewhere. I recognise, of course, presiding officer, that accuracy is not a matter for you, but if there is some other aspect, appendix or codicil to that draft climate change plan, which the government has neglected to publish, would you please give them the opportunity to do, to do so and lay it before Parliament at the earliest possible convenience? Thank you, Mr Harvey. I think you've offered the government that opportunity. Uh, it's not a point of order, but we conclude